it began like a lot of things with a phone call. Uh, my colleague, Marlene Newman, who I knew 30 years prior in graduate school, we had shared a class together, uh, a drawing class. Uh, the teacher was named Flora Natapoff. She was one of those miracle teachers that pulled the scales off your eyes and taught you to see living order. It was really powerful. It changed the way I thought about architecture, in fact. Kelly and I knew each other from graduate school at Harvard. And the, I was on the search and screen committee, and I told them that I had two candidates who would be really good if they wanted a world-class program. And we had taken these seminal drawing classes together, and that's how we met. So Marlene called and said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm teaching at Columbia. She said, you need to think about applying to Indiana University. There's a new program that was nine years ago, and it was called the IU Center for Art and Design, to be located here in the city of Columbus, Indiana. And I remember saying, or thinking, Indiana, where is that? If there were ever a place in the world where there should be an architecture school or program, it's here. And I don't think there's any other program that could rival the assets that are here. The city of Columbus put a million bucks into this process here, into this program. And, you know, from a political perspective, you know, you take a little bit of a risk when you make that kind of a commitment and you're hopeful that uh, the taxpayers follow. And they have. I, they think they've embraced what we've done here. They understand the value to the community. You know, Mr. Miller always used to say the process is more important than the product because we don't know what we're going to be working on together in the future, what challenges we'll actually experience. But nothing is more important than the way we treat one another in the process of working towards solutions. And that's what the process had always been about. There's just such a sense of community and collaboration and a sense that the community almost thinks as one. I recall walking across the plaza of the library where the Henry Moore sculpture is in the First Christian Church by Elio Saarinen and I am Pace Library on my left. And it was at twilight, it was in the fall, when the light is low enough with the setting sun that the lights inside buildings come on and you get two forms of light. And looking, as I walk across the plaza, my heart skipped a beat. I felt hope. Incredibly powerful thing to make you think that what was the best and most possible thing that could be invented with human endeavor and human energy was embedded into the DNA of the city. Uh, this is some strong medicine for an architecture program so that students feel that they can invent boldly and think with their communities and that a community will respect what they're thinking about. This is a wonderful thing. So th that was an early impression I had with this program. Because it's a brand new program, the people that we are getting are risk takers. We have like a really interesting group of students who are risk takers. We probably use this word too much, but certainly risk takers. We say this a lot because the program is new. I think we were told we're brave. Uh, we're all risk takers for being here. And, like we didn't know what classes we'd be taking prior to this semester, like right before. It's a situation that calls for all of us to step forward and really articulate to ourselves first and then to the community what we want out of an architecture education. The students that come are PhD, we have people with masters, we have people with um, different age groups, and the collective they produce is eclectic and wonderful because they don't share the same mindset. And you want sparks in your program. You don't want fire, but you want sparks. Yeah, I find them to be incredibly driven and vocal group. I mean, just ready to to let you have it in a way, good or bad. I really like that. I mean, they have chutzpah. They're able to challenge you as much as you're challenging them, and that friction makes for, I think, a, a good environment for creative education. I had been employed at a number of schools uh, on the East Coast, where I'm from. Each of these schools that I taught at, these Ivy League programs, what I noticed over many years of being there is that the ability to think for yourself and to invent meaningfully for something you personally believe deeply in. There was less room for that. A clever person would learn to separate the method of how they get taught from its principle. And those that could do that could take that principle and learn to then think for themselves. And very few people actually learn to take glasses 
that are ground for them by their professors off and look for themselves like that. The opportunity I had here for setting this program up was the idea that if you could wed artistic inquiry and architectural inquiry to each other again, that they may be able to find belief in how they think visually and the meaning with which visual ideas are produced and created and felt to inform the way in which they think about architecture and vice versa, to let those two things mix with each other. And drawing, freehand in particular, allows unscripted linkages between those things. My role as, a, as an artist teaching graduate students in architecture who know they're coming to a program that's going to require a focus on fine art. It's a whole new um, type of problem and type of student. And we're not requiring a portfolio or entrance. So most graduate students in, say, fine arts, they come in, they've got chops. You know, it's the graduate level is about concept. Here, we're sort of 30% of the class has no exposure whatsoever in those kinds of thinking beyond their one or two classes in undergraduate. And so after a whole year of drawing very intensely, because this is um, five hour studios twice a week of drawing, um, and it seems like a little outrageous at first until you do it for two semesters and you see people who came in not being able to really do anything more than a stick figure are taking on full on projects of, you know, light color atmosphere you know, very complex um, drawing problems. And they, and it, 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 you know, they, they're like, I didn't know that this was available to me. What happens when you're working digitally, you tend to have, you have to make a big commitment to, to that thing. Answer, yeah. And then you have, and so you put in a lot of time. Whereas if you're doing it by hand, you are, it's really quick. You, don't have to, you don't have to answer very many questions in order to get to some kind of idea of where you need to go. We have the students go out into the, to these remarkable buildings and with a sketchbook and no measuring tool, we say, draw the plan accurately. And they look at like, how am I supposed to do that without a measuring tool? And you're going, you pace yourself across the floor and count your footsteps. You walk 15 steps that way and five that way, what do you got? You got a one to three proportion. Can you draw a one to three proportion rectangle? You go, of course you can. Well, that's how you start it. And with practice, you get remarkably accurate. So we go to all these buildings and you, once you draw all their plans and their sections, their elevations and some drawings from perception perspectives, you can then say, what can we say about this building because of what I drew? And what you find because you draw, which slows down the process of looking and makes you digest, ingest what you're looking at. You see things you would have never saw if you pick up a camera. I'm fine to tell them, you pick up a camera, you put your eye out. One of our projects last semester was to um, take the plans of the library here and build it out of like build those plans, go in there, like 3D render the entire thing, like model the library, which is designed by IMP. And the first session I spent working on those plans, I think it was like eight hours straight. And I, I was like, that's it, I gotta go to yoga, which is right over there. I parked my car and I got my mat and I was in my own head and then I turned and like there it was, there was the library. But when I like saw it, there is this crazy feeling of like, just this creative possibility. Invention comes from convention, that the better you understand something and analyze the heck out of it, to, to with, with ringing it, almost rubbing it till it screams, that you've analyzed it so much, you know it so well, now it's easier to invent from it. It'll help you, because it all goes into these, call them saddlebags. You know, we got art saddlebag, one side, architecture saddlebag, and the other. And then when you go to design, you pull stuff out of those saddlebags to design with, and the way they come out of your saddlebag isn't the way you put them in, because it mixes with something that belongs to your own personality, your own nature. People say, wow, Indiana University, the School of Architecture, School of Design at Indiana University has really accomplished a lot. The community's accomplished a lot. We don't see things as being accomplished. We, things, we see things as beginnings. There are a whole lot of us, and I think a whole lot of people included in the school that think there are much greater things to come. I believe in the power of the individual imagination private conscientiousness about ideas 
and belief and where to find meaning in how we build our environments is essential to being human. I, we hope to build a program that makes a, a culture for that grow and thrive in a city that wants it, in a university that wants it, and in individuals who believe in it. I want to be able to give the student architecture the opportunity to have a shot at their own genius. Not everyone has it, but you have the right to have the opportunity to pursue this. And so this is what I think we're trying to do.